I was born in Rwanda. Now, Rwanda is a tiny country located in the Central Africa. It was and still is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Very green and perfect tropical weather. My village was in Kibuye. Our house was on a hill that overlooked Lake Kivu. My mom and dad were teachers. They were very good parents who were very respected in the village. In my family, we were four children. I was one girl among three boys. We loved each other a lot. We were very protective until the last time we separated. There was a rebellion going on, an ethnically based rebellion uh, in Rwanda. Right after the holiday, I had an exam, really an important exam. The regime in Rwanda that was responsible for the genocide was a criminal regime. It operated uh, according to the logic of criminal gangs. So I wrote to my parents and I told them I wanted to stay in school to prepare for my exam. And the aim of the, uh, of the uh, military dictatorship was to preserve power by eliminating that rebellion. My father said, we miss you and you have been away so much, away from us. So I went home. Easter vacation that year changed everything in my life. The president's plane was shut down and the genocide began. The two leaders died after attending peace talks aimed at ending decades of tribal conflict in the two countries. President Habyarimana of Rwanda and President Ntari Amira of Burundi were killed when their plane came down near the Rwandan capital Kigali. Both were members of the majority Hutu tribe. When the president's plane was shot down, it just was, was chaos. Within less than an hour, you started to hear the gunfire in your own neighborhood, right up close to you. Before, it was always kind of far away, and it's like it just spread everywhere. It was a very well-organized program of genocide. Uh, it had been established before the plane went down, and it was just waiting for this event, or an event like it, to click into motion. These people had lists. They had lists of people that had to be killed, they had, and then it became crazy. And I remember my father telling me, we are worried that you might get raped, and we, we are worried that we can't help you. They were going home to home, neighborhood to neighborhood, uh, breaking down doors, hacking people to death. Some of the names of uh, Tutsis were being broadcast on the radio. When I saw Immaculate back in, in her own home, area and she says to the photographer hey, come and take a picture of me with this man and and i'm asking her who's this man and she explains to me well his brother killed my brother and i'm like wait you know my western mind is kicking in and i got to understand who what the details and stuff and she just puts her arm around him and she says no it's okay it's okay i just about lost it because it's not okay you read in the powerful little museum here in Kigali, a young Rwandan child saying, if you would have really known me for who I was, you could have never killed me.
When I think about heroes here in Rwanda, I think about people like Immaculate who are willing now to share what life is like. Going back, touching on it, exploring it. For her to take the time and to visit these places with people like us and let us share in some of that grief and some of that process takes unimaginable courage. I did hate, of course. I was very angry. During the bathroom time, I couldn't understand how another human being can cause you so much pain. And why? We were all created. We never chose to be who we become. We don't choose our race. We don't choose our tribe. We don't even choose a country where we are born. And I thought that I can pay them back for what they were doing to me. And thank God, I was able to see that that was useless. That was only going to prolong the pain and hatred in this world. I hid in this tiny bathroom for 91 days and they never found me. But I found myself. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for inviting me to share my story with you. It is really a joy to be among people who give hope to people. You know, anytime I was looking for a job, I know how important it was. You are very important. <laughs> and you know, I still remember that through the whole genocide, among the lessons I learned was really to learn to be to know that my part matters, to have faith, to know that I have to do, to make the first step. And somehow, sometimes I have realized when I was looking for a job, I have to remember those lessons I learned in the bathroom. I had to do my part, even things seemed impossible. Have you met some people sometimes when they are looking for a job and you ask them, so what's going on? <laughs> and they tell you, well, I can't find a job. Well, do you have a resume? Have you tried? Like, well, there's no job. I didn't even fill up a resume. <laughs> and you realize that, yes, we have to have that hope. Just do the first step. It was a big lesson I learned through this terrible experience. And among many lessons, I learned also the importance of love, to love one another. If a genocide happened in our country, is because we failed to love one another. Our leaders failed to protect others, to care for them. Another big lesson was to know without a shadow of doubt that God is real. He is real in all the time. And to know that you can rely on him, on that superpower, it is just a treasure to have. Another big lesson was to know that actually forgiveness is possible all the time, in every situation, even if sometimes it might be hard to understand, but to be able to know that it's possible, it was also another huge lesson for me. When I was angry, I can still remember my body aching. I was paralyzed. I was a prisoner for my own anger. But when I was able to let it go, it felt like freedom. And I remember thinking, I wish I can tell everybody that actually it is possible. Before, when I was angry, I thought, how do you forgive somebody who is killing your mom, who is looking for you? It seemed impossible. But it felt like freedom. 
it felt like peace when it was there. And I'm here to tell everyone, forgiveness is possible, and anger hurts, and it paralyzes you. So the genocide was terrible, as you saw in the documentary, but it is, again, an experience that opened my eyes. I would not be here today if I have not come to let it go, if I have not learned what I learned. So genocide started, it was on April 7th, 1994. I was home for Easter holiday, and everything went, was going well. I had three brothers, one was outside of the country. My parents were teachers, loved us, cared for us, cared for the whole village. But we never forget that morning. My brother came to me and told me that the president of the country died. I jumped out of the bed, and I remember thinking, this is it, they are killing, they're going to kill us. In Rwanda, we had two main tribes, Tutsi and Hutus, and my tribe was not well loved. We knew somehow we were prepared. There is a radio that was supposedly private radio, but it was actually founded by the leaders who want to kill this one tribe for the matter of power. So we knew it can happen, but how? But that morning, it had started. I went outside, I met my parents, and we were listening to the radio. We heard that they already shut down every activity in the country 10 minutes after the president died. And my parents asked me to go to hide. I didn't want to go, but I left out of obedience to them, to my father. And I remember when I was leaving, he handed me the rosary beads. I can feel it in my heart. It was over. I will never see them again. We separated before, but not with the rosary. It was almost like my father was telling me, in case I'm not here again, you know what to do. Pray and ask God for help. I left. I went to my neighbor, and I went because I was, again, one girl among the three boys. Everyone wanted to protect me. I went to the neighbor. I told him what my parents told me, to come there. And this was somebody from the other tribe. Not everyone was killing from the other tribe. There were many great people who were trying to protect other people. It was another big lesson I learned. You know, never to put people in the boxes because everyone is individual and everyone make their own choices. It was a big lesson my dad used to tell us to always open your heart and treat people individually as they come to you. But when I saw that, I realized how right he was. This man, I went to his home, he put me right away to this tiny bathroom, three by four feet. I remember when I went there, I said, this is too small for me. I can't sit there. I mean, three days before that, I had a scholarship in college. I was paid to go to school. Three days before that, I had my own home, my own room in my parents' house. And things can change that quickly. So. As I was complaining, he went back and brought five more women. Later, he brought two more women. It was another big lesson. When you think things are bad, they can get worse. <laughs> but we had to feed eight people in three by four feet. The youngest was seven years old. The elder was 55. He told us not to talk to one another, not to make any noise, not even to flush the water of the bathroom until somebody is flushing the water in the next bathroom. He told his children that he lost the key of the bathroom. We sat there. I went through so many emotions I never thought were possible. Anger that can kill you. Impatience that can kill you. All these emotions there you never thought you had. And I remember one time he came to give us food. I asked him to put a radio outside, and I couldn't believe what was going on in the country. The leaders who used to tell us to love one another, they were calling people to kill everybody of my tribe. I remember one government minister said, do not forget children. A child of a snake is a snake. A child of a cockroach is a cockroach. So they killed people who ran to churches, to stadiums. And it was for us, they started searching home, home by home. Every village, they have three to 400 people going every day. But that was also a time that changed me. You know, when things are not so bad yet, 
you really don't learn yet. <laughs> and I remember the time they came to search our home. I felt them out, I heard them outside, outside of the bathroom. This was a four bedroom house. There's nothing in my heart can tell me they might not find us. I knew it was over. Three to four hundred people. They started to scream when they came inside. And somehow I remember feeling like I had two voices over my shoulders. Pain I cannot put in words. It was like a thousand needles is going through my body. Like you are on fire, but you are not dying. And these voices, nothing too strange. You know, when you are about to go through an obstacle and one voice is telling you, give up, don't do that, do it, no, be strong. I had one voice who was discouraging me and was telling me, open the door and the torture. They're going to find you anyway. And that voice was right. It sounded like me being reasonable. But another voice was telling me, do not open the door. Ask God to help you. Remember who God is? God is almighty. You know what almighty means? It means he can do anything. Even if they find you, they might not be able to touch you or to see you. You know what it is to have that faith? If only I can have it all the time. But I realized how beautiful that was and I felt like life was coming back to my body. But that voice convinced me there's no God. And I really wanted to open. I was confused. But somehow I remember asking God with all, every cell of my body. And I asked him in prayer, if there is anyone there, if there is anyone who put all this together, anyone who controlled my breath, I am begging you, Jay, show me a sign that you can hear me. And I remember for asking for a specific sign, because I didn't want to get confused who did it. If it was luck, or if it was really him who did it. So I asked him, don't let them open the door of the bathroom. If they don't, just today, because you know, there are many good people who are dying. Who am I to say I can't die? I just wanted to know, is he there? After I asked that, just don't let them open this door. I fainted. It was about five hours later, the man who was hiding us came, opened the door, we jumped. We thought it was a killer's. For five hours, we were still frozen. And he told us what happened. He said they went everywhere in the house, in the ceiling of the house with flashlights, on the roof of the house, under the beds. They even opened suitcases to make sure there were no babies hiding. At last, they came right to the door of the bathroom. And before one of the killers opened, he looked at the man who was hiding us and said, you know what, we trust you. You are one of us. And they turned around and left. When he told us, to me what went through my mind was, oh my God, God is real. <laughs> he heard me in the bathroom, not even in the church. And I started to pray. I asked the man to give me the Bible because I wanted to find out who was that God? What is this life about? What went wrong? That the God of love who created all this, these terrible things can happen. It's so funny. Every page I opened in the Bible, I felt like it was love your enemies. And I would close the page. No, 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 no. My enemies are bad. And then I would open another page. Pray for those who persecute you. Oh God, you don't know those who are persecuting me. They are terrible. Close the page. Forgive those who hate you. How many times? Seven, seven, seven times. I can't even forgive once. And I will close the page. How do you do this? And I started to pray the rosary my father had given me. But it's really, the rosary is like the summary of the Bible. So I was not running away. And I prayed from morning until night because I knew this time God was real. And I remember one part of this prayer that changed me. Our Lord is prayer. What our Lord told us to pray. I remember when I reached this part that said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I couldn't say it. By that time, I knew that God can see in my heart. I knew he heard my prayer. I knew he was real. And if he is, he can hear my thoughts. How do you lie to him and tell him, but help me. But 
forgive as I forgive? No, I haven't forgiven. For the first time, I started to skip that part of the prayer because I didn't want to lie to God. You can lie to somebody else, but not the one who looks from inside. And I felt much better. Until one day, I felt like something was telling me, hey, I hope you know our Lord's prayer is not man-made. It's Jesus. You believe he's God who gave those words. If I were you, I wouldn't try to change his prayer. I understood in that moment the meaning of surrendering. I went on my knees and I begged God, if you know how to forgive, help me out. I never thought that was ever going to come. But the moment came as I was, when I was meditating on a part of the rosary, when Jesus was dying on the cross, and when he said, it took me by surprise, even if I knew it died before, Give them, Father, they don't know what they do. It wasn't the first part. It was the second. I wanted to forgive, but how? How? How do you forgive somebody maybe who killed your mom or your dad already? How? They don't get it. I feel like Jesus was telling me, people are trying to kill you. They don't even measure the consequences that will come on them. And that for all of us. When we hurt people, when we act selfishly, when we kick them to get our way, there is always consequences coming soon or later. And I felt like he was making it clear. Those who are hurting you, they will not be able to live with their own consciences for what they have done. Let them go. You don't have to be like them. It was almost like life was, the world was divided in two parts. All of a sudden, there is a part of love and there's a part of hate. And on the part of love, there are people like Mother Teresa, people like Mandela, people like Gandhi, people who have suffered. But no matter what they suffer, nothing will change their mind. They will stand for truth, they will stand for love, they will stand for peace. And the people who are on the side of hate are people like Hitler, those who are killing us who are causing trouble and trouble and revenge, and the cycle goes on. Trouble. And I felt like Jesus was asking me, where do you want to be? With Hitler or with Mother Teresa? And you cannot be on both sides. We cannot have hate and love in the same heart. We had to choose. It was that time when I saw it clear. Of course, I admire Mandela. I admire Mother Teresa. These are the people I think are strong. Who did the right thing? And when I moved to their side, I was in a good company. It was like a huge luggage was lifted. I wanted to be like them. I wanted to spread peace. I wanted to say this is stronger. I wanted to move people from here and change their mind as I was changing to come on this side. It was then I felt this must be what they call forgiveness, the peace I'm feeling, the freedom to dream. If you read my book, Left to Tell, I started learning English when I was still in the bathroom. Because when the anger was gone, this force, this sickening force in my heart, in my head, in my mind, was occupying my mind. When it was gone, I was left with a question. Now what do I do with my life, since I'm not angry anymore? I had to learn English just in case I might have to find a job with people who speak English. I had to think about my future. How do I take care of myself? And the girls thought I was going crazy, but it was so clear. So funny, actually. The English I learned in the bathroom, I had to read a book in English. I asked the man to give me. And the dictionary English French, using one word per word and going to check the meaning of it. And it's so funny. Every phrase I memorized in that bathroom Three months later, I found myself sitting in an interview with United Nations, exactly being asked the same questions in English. What's your name? I'm like, I know that question. I already host in the bathroom. And it really, I mean, it's amazing how we can be prepared. But all that, it was really because the anger was out. We ended up staying in that bathroom for three months. The very first time I came out, I was hoping that maybe 
some members of my family are still hiding, as I was, but I found out everybody was killed. My mom was killed, my dad, my two brothers, my grandma, my grandpa, my neighbors, my schoolmates, my friends. It was like end of the world. A million people was killed in a period of three months. Rwanda is the size of Maryland state. You can cross the country in six, eight hours. Everywhere was dead bodies. And a part of me was calling me, die, crush. What do you do when you, you see this, when you have nobody? But there was a strength in me. I felt like God was holding my stomach and my chest and was reminding me, don't crush, don't die. I am with you. The journey of your loved ones is over here, but not over there. But yours is still here. And it is up to you how you choose to deal with it, how you choose to use it. It might be one more year, one week, one day, 10 years, 50 years. But whatever that is, life is your gift and it is up to you how you choose to use it. Either to love or to hate, to uplift or to bow down, to be kind or to be mean. If you choose love, I am with you. If you choose kindness, I am with you. And it is literally, I have learned how to just respect that voice. I will wake up in the refugee camp and start looking around. Somebody I can give help. Just in case, that will be my last day. And that became the motivation of my life. I really think I live happier than when I thought I had everything. Because I don't know when it is going to end. Like again, that moment, it can be one more day for all of us. We take it for granted, but we don't know how long we live. But whatever life we have, we can choose to really, really live it joyfully. Take advantage, do something good. So when you lay down at night, you can say, I have contributed. I have done something kind. I have helped somebody. That's what gives me my joy. That's what helps me to be alive and to hope that one day I can see my parents. I can meet my brothers again. And before I leave, I want to remind you. I know many times we speak to a group, and it is a group, but everyone is individual. And we all have our own experiences. We all have our own troubles, our own obstacles we face. Please, from my heart to yours, no matter what happens to you, remember there is always hope. Don't give up. Keep pressing and love every minute of your life. It is your gift. It is up to you how you choose to use it. And lastly, if I can forgive, anybody can forgive. Thank you so much for having me.